Uh, we left out of here, got, we left here after church, got to the house, grabbed a few things, threw it in the RV, and we took it off. And I had just sort of made up my mind I was going to get across the state of Missouri. Uh, maybe I was going to try to make it to Tulsa. I wasn't sure how far I'd go, but uh, I started hurting, and uh, my back and legs were hurting real bad and everything like that. Next thing I know, I'm pulling in Joplin, and Lisa said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to pull in for the night. She says, well, it's only like 7 o'clock. You can go for hours. And I said, well, I'm hurting, you know, and I said, I've always wanted to try this out. They say you can boondock, you can park an RV at a Walmart. I always wanted to do that. So I said, I'm pretty sure they rebuilt the Walmart after the tornado that they had go through Joplin. I mean, it tore out. You can tell where it tore out. So we're at this Walmart in Joplin. And um, we go in. First thing you got to do when you get to Walmart is go in Walmart. Buy something. So I, I asked them, I said, I got an RV, can I park it out here? They said, sure, we close at 11, but yeah, you can, you can stay out there as long as you're gone the next day. I said, yeah, we'll be gone. So um, Lisa noticed that uh, a screw had come out of the shower door, the back shower door. A screw had come out where that handle is. And so... Um, I didn't, I looked in my toolbox and I didn't, I was outside looking through my toolbox and didn't see a screw big enough to fit that. Next thing I know, as you turn your Bible to Exodus 20, next thing I know, I hear a voice behind me. Now, understand this. I asked Lisa on the way down, I said, did you bring your gun? She said, no. I was planning on bringing my AR. We were gunless. And I hear a guy behind me. I'm down on the ground in the parking lot looking for screws. And I hear a guy behind me saying, excuse me, sir. And that kind of shook me a little bit. And I turned around and I looked at this guy and he was kind of a little rough looking, you know, road weary, I guess. And he said, um, he told me some story about a part he needed for his car. I don't know what that was all about. So, but he said he needed $28. And he said for a part that he could get that would fix it all up. And I said, I don't carry cash on me when I travel. And I said, I tell you what, I got to go in and I'm trying to think of a way to tell him no is what I'm doing. I'm trying to think of a nice way, George, to tell this man, no, I don't have any money. I'm sorry I can't help you. But I just, I don't know, you follow the Lord. And he said, you know, he said, I can give you, I can trade you any, I got a bunch of tools, I'll trade you any tool that you want. And I said, sir, I'll tell you what, I said, I got to go inside Walmart here and I got to get a couple screws from my shower door inside, make my wife happy. And I said, what I'll do is I'll buy some screws and I'll get some cash for you, the, the cash that you need. And I said, I'll be, I'll be right back. So I went inside the store and I found the screws that I needed. It was like $5. And for a little box of different size screws and everything like that. And I, and I went, to, when I put the card in, I was going to try to get $28 in cash out. What he asked for. Well, the machine didn't offer me $28. It offered me $20 or $40. So I hit 40. And then I thought, I'll give him 40. It's not a big deal. $40 for a man's soul, that's not much. And when I got the money, and as I'm walking out, in my mind, in my heart's mind, I'm hearing... 
Tell him your name. Tell him your name. Okay. So I get out there. I'm hoping he's gone. I mean, I, I got a nature in me that's stingy just like all the rest of y'all do. I ain't giving them money. It's their own fault they ain't got no money. That's, I got that guy in me. So when I get out there, I see their car. So I knock on the trailer door and I said, Caleb, come with me. And I actually gave Caleb my little razor knife that I carry. And I said, just kind of stand there in case something happens. I don't know who this guy is. So I walked over there and the guy met me and I said, here's 40 bucks. That's more than what you asked for. Go get something to eat. And he went, are you sure? I said, yeah, don't worry about it. And he said, now come look at my tools that I've got. I said, I don't want your tools. I said, I'm as good at, with one end of a screwdriver as I am the other. <laughs> and I said, I, I don't want your tools. I said, but I want you to do something for me. He said, what's that? I said, I want you to remember something. He said, what? I said, remember my name. My first name is Mike. He said, okay, Mike. I said, my last name is Hoggard. And I said, I want you to look me up on YouTube. And as soon as I said that, I guess, I don't know if it's his wife, his girlfriend, his fiance, whatever they call them nowadays. She was sitting in the front seat of that car. She came up out of that car and she went, oh, we want you. We know who you are. We watch you on YouTube all the time. God, guns, and liberty, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, we're, we're like survivalists. Now, my thought was, if he needed 28 bucks, he's not a good survivalist. Okay? He's not doing a good job of it. But those people knew me. Had I, got, had I let the mean guy come out and said, I don't have any money and I'm not giving you any money. They would have watched, God would have made sure they watched me on YouTube. And after talking to him for a while, I thought about it and I said, they're going to watch me again on YouTube now. Now that they've met me and now that they know what God led me to do for them, they're going to watch more of my videos. And so I want you, to, I don't know their names. I want you to pray for that couple that we'll see them surrounding the throne of glory with palms in our hands, and while we're celebrating Jesus, they're going to come over and say, remember us? And I'm going to say, yeah, I do. People, you're never not a Christian. You're never not a Christian. Exodus chapter 20, I know it's 12 now. So, I'm going to try to go through this. I don't know how far I'll get, but this is a message on the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Commandment number one, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, boy, I got my screen messed up here thou shalt have no other gods before me then commandment number two verse four thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image how many any zero graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above now I want you to I want you to look at that any likeness. Now I know probably most of us have got some kind of painting of Jesus somewhere. And you have to ask the question, does that include that? Now I can't give you the answer to that. I don't know that. I don't know that. 
But I have a sneaking suspicion about the Antichrist. And that is, I think he will look like 99% of the paintings that have been made of Jesus Christ. I think he will look like every one of those. And I think the world is going to be deceived by an image of Christ that has been burned into our collective minds. And they'll say, well, it looks like Jesus, well, then it must be Jesus. And so I want you to be careful about that. If you compare uh, Isaiah 53, what Isaiah 53 said about Jesus... And then you look at what John said about the appearance of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. There's a little bit of a difference. And I believe that Jesus will appear in the air. And those of us, watch this now, those of us who know him by this appearance will know that that's the real Jesus and we will not be deceived. So I, I, I'm telling you, I think y'all be careful about paintings. I know it doesn't say paintings, but it said any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Ask yourself the question, where does the beast come from? He rises up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So he, is, he fits that description. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now I've got a I've got a little message at on that third and fourth generation. Now I guarantee you I will not be able to get into today, but I, I have a suspicion that I think I know what that means. And if you've followed me for years and know what I believe about numbers and what these numbers represent, I think that God is going to fulfill this in the end times to a generation that he calls the fourth generation. And I think it's going to match the fourth kingdom where they, whoever they are, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. I think that's going to be God's final curse upon mankind. He is sealing their doom. They will be at that moment twice dead forever at that day. And he said, um, verse 6 now, and showing mercy. Now I like this. God is a just God. God is a jealous God. God will judge the earth and he will judge each one of us individually not for what everybody else did to you, but for what you did personally. God will judge every one of us, but God also is a merciful, loving, kind, willing to forgive God. Somebody say amen. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy. Mercy, God's a merciful God, unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now I could preach a really short message here and let you all out of here by saying this. If you pray, bow to, burn incense to, attend a church wherein are statues of Jesus or Joseph or Mary or Paul or Peter or anybody else for that matter, you can count on the wrath of God being poured out on you for eternity. 
However, if you refuse and you look at those things and say, that is not Mary, that is not Jesus, that is not Joseph, that is not Paul, that is not Peter, that's not any of the saints, that's not the archangel Michael, that is nothing but a, but a rock that they dug up out of the earth. That's nothing but a tree that they cut down out of the woods. That is nothing but a stick and a stalk and a stone. And I'll have nothing to do with that. The God that I serve was not made with hands. The God that I serve is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who had no beginning and he will have no end. That's the God I serve. I believe God will have mercy on you. Don't you? Somebody say amen. He is a God that shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep my commandments. Now, I want to tell you something. God has an issue with statues, idols, iconography. That was one of the terms that we learned. I do remember some of the things I learned in Bible college. They weren't all bad. There was at one time in the very, very early days of the, of the church... Something called the iconoclastic heresy or the iconoclastic controversy where in, in the early days, I'm talking in the uh, AD 150s, 200s, 250s and so on, before the emperor of Rome turned everybody into, uh, uh, in the Roman Empire into a Christian by waving his hand over and say everybody now is a Christian. I do know that early on, there was already a push by some of the early churches to carve out images of Jesus Christ, at least of Jesus. I'm not sure or aware of anything beyond that or possibly of Moses and some of the other patriarchs that we see in the Bible and use them the way the Catholic Church lies and says, now we don't really worship them. We just use them as an image to, br to draw our minds to the God that is behind them. But if God told you not to have them, then you are lying through your teeth about your reasoning why you've got them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings, uh, Lord, upon this message. Lord, you, you preach, Father, what you want to preach. I know, Father, I have way more notes than what I have time this morning. And I want to be, uh, I want to be respectful to these people. But, Father, Lord, I want to be obedient unto you. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that uh, you'd fill our hearts and our minds, Father, with what you would have us to know today. We'll save the rest of it for next Sunday, Lord, if we have to, or give it tonight, or whatever. But Father, you just have your way in this service and have me preach what you'd have me to preach. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I cannot preach this message, but what I, have to, I have to retell this story again that I've told probably a dozen times uh, over the years. This, this really, really touched me in a way that I just, I've never had a conversation like this with somebody in my life. Uh, in, in this manner, we were at um, a, a prophecy conference in Dallas, Texas, and um, it really, uh, you know, it, it wasn't really going well as far as the attendance was concerned. There wasn't a lot of people showed up for it. It was in a bad location and it just, it just all kinds of bad things were going on there. But one lady came up to me and she said, you are, you are Mike Hargood, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, I've been watching your videos. And she said, I want you to know I appreciate some of the things that you're saying. Now, I'm, you know, anytime I hear some of the things you're saying, I'm, I'm, I always go, uh-oh, what am I fixing to get in trouble for? And uh, she said, I do appreciate some of the things you're saying on there. But she said, I wish you would reconsider uh, your, your stand on the Catholic Church. And, I, of course, I'm shooting what they call flare prayers to God. I'm going, God, help me out here. I need, I need help. I need you to say something for me because I ain't smart enough to answer her. And I did. I shot up a little prayer to God. God, help me out. Tell me what to say. God said, say this. So she talked for a while. And I said, ma'am, I said, let me, let, me ask you, let me ask you to do something for me. 
I said, next time you go to your Catholic church, you, you attend regularly. She said, yes, I do. And I could tell that she had a love and an admiration for her church. Some people were raised that way and they don't know any other way. So it is our responsibility as a church, not just mine, not just mine. It is our responsibility as a church to the people that we meet and the people that we know in a loving, caring way to them. Love them enough to share with them the scriptures and what they say about what Catholics believe. And do it in a loving manner. Now, this is what God laid on my heart. I said, ma'am, here's what I want you to do. The next time you walk into your church and you look around and you see Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and any of the other statues that they have. You know, you, if you've never been in a Catholic church, I, I, you can go down here to the old cathedral down here by the arch, and it's usually open throughout the day. It's sort of like a museum, but it's still an operating church. And if you ever want to see what the inside of a Catholic church looks like, go in there. You're going to see people, and you're going to see people walk in and touch the holy water and cross them, bless themselves with it. You're going to see them go in and you're going to see them genuflect, which is this before the, before the crucifix. And they may go over to, there's a statue of Mary. They may walk over there touch the feet of Mary or holy water and bow and pray a prayer to that statue of Mary. You'll see that if you go in there and sit down there long enough, you'll see that that's, that, that that's what they do. And I said, ma'am, the next time I want I, you go in your church, I want you to look at all of those statues made out of stone, ceramic, Whatever it is they're made out of, if they, if they were carved out of wood, overlaid with gold or whatever. The next time you go in, I want you to look at them and then I want you to remember this verse. The second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee, and she stopped me before I could get to the rest of it. She cut me off, D, and she said, I know, I know. Our priest told us that it's a sin to bow down to statues of false gods. And I said, ma'am, no, that is not what the Bible, what the commandment said. Because let me tell you something. There is a difference between the Catholic Bible which has the second commandment in it and the catechism which takes the second commandment out of it. Am I telling the truth? If you've ever... I've got Catholic catechism, catechisms. The catechism is what you must learn as an, someone to be introduced to the Catholic faith, the catechism is what you must learn in order to be able to participate in the rites and the rituals and the ceremonies and everything else of the Catholic Church. You are ordered to memorize or to know the catechism and recite the catechism but not necessarily the scriptures. So while you, as a young Catholic growing up, you're going to catechism class, they're teaching you the Ten Commandments. They have deliberately omitted the Second Commandment out of the teaching, and they've taken the Tenth Commandment, 
that says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, that's the ninth commandment. The tenth commandment is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. That's the tenth commandment. They took the tenth commandment and split it in half to make sure that there was still ten commandments. Because everybody knows, all you have to do is watch Charlton Heston. And you know there's ten commandments. Right? So if you learn the catechism, you will never learn that God said not to make any image. And I said, ma'am, that is not what the Bible says. Not even your Bible. Your Bible says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, the likeness of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor shalt thou pray to them. I said, ma'am, that's what the Bible said. So your priest told you a lie, is what I said. And I wasn't mean to her. I wasn't trying to be condescending to her. I was very loving and caring about her. But God gave that to me to say to her, tell her. That I commanded, not her priest, I commanded that they're not even supposed to be made to begin with. And then even if they're made, you're not supposed to bow down to them. And you're not supposed to pray to them. And she acted like she had never heard that a day in her life. And I was saddened by that. You know the story there on the screen. As God is giving Moses the second commandment, as God is taking his finger and writing out the second commandment, the children of Israel are at the bottom of Mount Sinai saying to Aaron, Moses has been up there 40 days. He's not coming back. He's dead. Up, let us make us gods and we will go back to Egypt. And they commanded Aaron and Aaron was just as guilty as they were complicit in this. When they started pulling off the earrings that the Egyptians had given them and the gold that the Egyptians had thrown at them and they tossed them into that and according to Aaron's story, out popped this calf. It's a miracle. But Aaron referred to that calf. These be thy gods, O Israel, which have led thee out of bondage. He said, that's your God. Worship it. That's what lets you out of bondage. You can understand why God was angry. You can understand why Moses, upon coming down from Mount Sinai, seeing that image there, taking those Ten Commandments. The, I mean, my goodness. If I had a stone in my hand that had been written by the finger of God... I've got a trillion dollars in my hand. Don't I? I can sell that to the Cairo Museum and live on that trillion dollars for the rest of my life. Moses took it, threw it on the ground and broke them into pieces. Because they had already broken just about every one of those commandments that was written on there anyway. My question to you is, have you broken the second commandment? And I'm not even getting to the heart of the message yet. And I won't today. Psalm 115.2 Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. 
Let me ask you a question. Those of you who, who, who used to be Catholic, raise your hand. Did you ever see the statue move? Did the statue ever say anything? Did you ever see it get up and walk around the church? In fact, let me ask you this question. How did it get from where it was manufactured to where it was sitting in the church? How did it get from A to B? How did it get there? In a truck! A U-Haul! And guys picked it up in a crate, brought it in, unloaded the crate, set it up there, decorated it, and said, These be our gods, our powerful gods, that are so powerful that they can't even get up and walk themselves. Let's read this. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths. But they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Now I want you to remember all of this. Because of what I'm going to preach next Sunday on this. This is a two-part sermon. Say thank you, Pastor Mike. You're welcome. Amen. They have... They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, and so is every one that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Now I want you to look back at what he says here. It says that they that make them are like them. In other words, the man who makes an idol is just as dumb, just as blind, just as deaf, and just as impotent as that dead piece of stone or wood that he carved out. He can do nothing. And then he said, they that make them are like to them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. The people who pray to idols are blind, deaf, dumb and impotent and they can do nothing. They are just as dead as the tree they cut down to make that. Now I have a little thing about what I believe is coming in the future. This verse tells us that those who make the images and the idols and those who trust or pray to the idols and worship the idols are going to end up being like the idols. And in Revelation 13, we know that the idol in Revelation 13 has the ability to speak and to think. And I believe that all of the people of the earth who are going to worship that image are going to join then and become just like that image whom God is going to destroy. Psalm 135 verse 15, The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them, and so is everyone that trusteth in them. Now that's two witnesses now that in your Bible that just told you what I just told you. I want you to study, I, I want you to study Revelation 13. That's your homework for this week. In preparation for next week. 
because just as in the Catholic Church, by the way, that is not Jesus. Neither is that. But they are one and the same. They're both deaf, dumb, blind, and impotent. Neither the crucifix can save your soul, and neither can the Pope save your soul either. Now, you all said amen to that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's great. And by the way, it's not just in Catholic churches. It's in Protestant churches too. Protestant churches are slowly but surely turning into idolatry churches. Where they have images of angels. Images of Christ in there. I mean statues of Christ in there. Lutheran churches. Some other types of mainline denomination churches. I've even seen an Assembly of God church. Had a big statue of a huge angel inside the foyer. God said don't do that. Now, there is, a, there is a worse kind of idol. And that's what I'm going to preach on next Sunday. A far worse idol than what the Catholic Church has, what all the Buddhists have, what all the um, Hindu have with their 330 million gods. There is a worse kind of idol and it's in your Bible and I'm going to show you next Sunday that more than likely you've been guilty of worshiping that idol and it will doom your soul to hell just as much as falling and praying to one of those statues let's stand to our feet